If you will, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3 and also open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5 this morning. And also as we look at where marriage came from, who organized marriage, who orchestrated marriage, that was uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. That was God Almighty that set this thing up called marriage. We've been, uh, we, we decided uh, to move the soundboard and everything for the last two weeks, and I'm not sure if you've noticed, we've been trying to keep it as inconspicuous as possible, but we keep having technical errors on occasion, so it's not as simply just moving things up. It, everything seems to work fine Friday, and then Aaron and I were talking, and I said, hey, it looks great, it's going to work, and then Aaron said, yeah, till Sunday, and sure enough, Sunday, and things are just off this morning, but um, either way... <coughs> When it comes to this idea of marriage, we, we tend to think, well, where did it come from? Where, where do we go in Scripture to find out what marriage is and, and how, how does it relate to, to me and to my particular situation? Is what we see in culture now, is it, is it helpful? Is uh, what we're inundated with as far as helping our marriages, is it fine? And is it, is it fine speaking of fine? Is the slide's fine. We're good to go? No, we're not good to go? <clears throat> okay. Well, we're going to have to come back to this illustration. It was a whole series of things. So hold that thought, and we'll come back to that uh, illustration. Um, when it comes to this idea, we're going to be exploring Ephesians chapter 5 and beginning in verse number uh, 33. So let's read this text together. And we're first going to look at the failure to worship, the failure to worship. And in this, we're going to see a list of lies that Satan has for us and apply that directly when it comes uh, to our marriage relationship. And we're going to go back to the very beginning. But let's look through this, this passage. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 22. It says this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That's Christ sanctifying the church so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Again, as we're thinking through this idea of marriage and we think through this idea of what worship is, that all of life being a worship issue and the act of marriage also is a worship issue. If you're struggling with worship, if you're struggling with submission, it's not that you're... you're, you're don't think that submission applies to you. It's, as Vodi Bakum says, it is a worship disorder. So if you're struggling in submission, if you're struggling, husbands, to love your wives, it is not that's the issue. The root issue is that it's a worship disorder. So when we come to this first point, the failure, the failure to worship. There are often times when we forget to worship our Heavenly Father. When that happens, it draws us away from our Creator. It takes our eyes, it takes our focus from God, and it places it on self. That's why it's a worship disorder. You're saying, these are my needs. My partner is not meeting those needs. It's a worship disorder. You're saying it's their fault, it's God's fault. God's the one that brought us together, after all. And we begin to lie in that relationship. Turn back with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to take a look at these uh, four lies that are often found in relationships that begin to get a foothold into you and your spouse and can eventually cause severe damage. Number one, the first lie is that God is not truthful. 
God is not truthful. We find this in Genesis 3 and the first verse. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say? He begins to put a little bit of doubt in there. And even with our relationships, when we talk about our, our marriages, we, we, we think of this particular lie. Marriage is not monogamous. God never said it straight up. God wasn't truthful in that. God is a liar. No, God is not a liar. The liar is Satan. It's even said in John 8, 44, You are of your father, the devil, and your, your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. This first lie, God is not truthful. And when this comes into your life, when this comes into your marriage, that God being not truthful, then you actually start to believe the lies of Satan. Huh, did God actually say that? Should I actually follow through with that? And when these lies begin to creep in, it turns our worship from God to self. It begins to put in motion this idea of worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Again, this part in Ephesians, Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, was not just randomly placed there. I hope you know that about your Bibles, that God had a purpose in where he put things in Scripture. There was no accident that all of a sudden uh, Paul's writing to the Ephesians, oh, by the way, why don't you also deal with this matter? No, that's not how, how it works. No, it, it, it talks of, of how, uh, how involved marriage is in worship and worship in marriage. And again, like I joked before, uh, worship is not husbands, your wives worshiping you or wives, your husbands worshiping you or your children worshiping you. That's not what we're saying at all. Our eyes all together collectively as a family unit, we're worshiping our Heavenly Father. And then these other things continue to take care of each other as we are submitting ultimately to God. The second lie being this is God is not loving. God is not loving. You're missing out on certain things in your relationship. It says, Satan continues, he says, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden. You know, whereas Eve is testifying to Satan, well, God said we could have anything except for this one particular tree. Well, then Satan begins to bring this lie in to your relationship and saying, well, <laughs> everything's better over there. You're really missing out over there. What you're supposed to do is not what you're, you're doing. You know, you need to explore. You need to do this. You need to do that. God is not loving in that relationship. The third lie is this, that God is not righteous. God is not righteous. Satan tells Eve, you will not surely die. God will not punish sin. You do whatever makes you happy, whether that is before, during, or after marriage. My friend, my brother, my sister, God is righteous. God is full of judgment. But it, my dear brother, my dear sister, he is so loving. He is a gracious, merciful, caring Heavenly Father. And the fourth lie is this. God is not gracious. God is not gracious. He's not willing to give you what you ultimately deserve. Satan says this. God wants to keep you from knowing good and evil. Satan wanted to be as God, but you see, the Bible teaches us that we're not like God. We're not as God. Small little difference. Satan says, you be your own God. Your own little autonomous God. That's who you are. What does God's grace want us to be? God's grace wants us to be like Him. Adrian Rogers says that. God is not gracious. God is not righteous. God is not loving. God is not truthful. And when it comes to this idea of marriage and our relationships, we can go all throughout uh, the best booksellers. We can go to Amazon. We can go to B Barnes & Noble, wherever you buy your books. And you can look up the top 100 books on marriage. And would you know, they have a lot of them. 
They have 100 in order. They have even more than that over and over and over again. So whatever your problem is, there's probably a book for that. For example, maybe this is your thought. I feel like we're on two different planets. Well, there's a book for you. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. You say, well, I don't like that one. I don't like that illustration. That planet illustration doesn't do that for me. Well, how about this one? Men are mountains and women are rivers. Kristen told me one earlier this week, what is it? Men are like waffles. Women are like spaghetti. So whatever illustration you want, there's probably a book for that. How about this one? Enough illustration, just shoot it to me straight. Maybe you're like that. Well, here's a book for you. Marriage ain't for punks. <laughs> that one will get you. I bet you that's a top seller. Ah, too straightforward. Give me some lists that will help me. Maybe you're a list person. Okay. 131 necessary conversations before marriage. <laughs> Man, you got that one? You got all 131 of them? Kind of an odd number, right? Way too many. Can you shorten it up a bit? Okay. Nine thoughts that can change your marriage. Just nine of them. That's a little bit easier to tackle. Still too many. Eight dates. How about this one? Again, too many. Anything less than eight? There are a bunch. Seven principles for making marriage work. The five love languages. I don't like that cover. Maybe you're in the military. There's one for you. The military edition. You say, okay. How about this one? I'm a, I'm a teenager. That one's no singles. This one's a singles one. I'm a single five love languages. How about for teenagers? Four laws of love. Still too many? Okay, it takes one to tango. You can just do it by yourself, right? <laughs> on and on. There are so many books out there. And again, I, I'm not giving you this. I know it's comical, but I'm not downplaying these. I'm simply saying that there are so many out there, and your situation may not line up with every one of these authors' situations. These were written by men. They were written by fallible men. And what happens when you read fallible men? Sometimes you get a failure to worship because you're not worshiping God's design. You're instead sometimes, I'm not saying it's all the time, you can get a lot of really good things. I am a proponent of reading. I love reading. I encourage you to read. However, w sometimes we are so focused on the material in front of us that we forget to look at the scriptures. We forget to worship the one who created the intellect for us to be able to write and for us to be able to uh, learn of the different things in Scripture. If they're placing their own experience over the Word of God, you need to mark that author. You need to say, I, I appreciate you, but I'm going to stick to the Word of God. I'm going to stick to the sufficient counsel that God provides for me. And again, uh, otherwise, the lies will begin to creep in. And as we discuss, God is not truthful. God is not loving. God is not righteous. God is not gracious. And we get to the, the question, how can I overcome the lies of the enemy? Well, back to our books. Well, there's a book for that, Seven Ways to Overcome the Lies of the Enemy. Again, there's a lot out there. But where can we overcome that? By looking to Scripture. John 8, 44, you are of the father, the devil. Again, as it's said that, that, that the devil, he is a liar and the father of lies. Hebrews 2, 14, since therefore the children shall share, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Christ shed blood for sins. That's what Satan cannot destroy. Satan cannot overpower our Lord Jesus Christ. His accusations, his lies are no longer valid. Why? Because the payment of Jesus Christ. Because the payment that we see here in Hebrews 12 and verse number 4. The only thing that could sentence us to eternal destruction is unforgiven sin. It's for us to say that that Bible stuff, that forgiveness of sin stuff, that's not for me. I've never once repented of my sin. I have no desire to turn to Jesus Christ. That is the sentence of eternal destruction. But the cross, in the cross, you can obtain complete forgiveness. The devil can only kill us, but he cannot damn us. He cannot send us to eternity in the lake of fire. 
His lies are defeatable. Ways in which you can defeat that is through Scripture. So we've established this foundation of what happens when our focus in our marriage begins to turn. Our worship begins to turn towards self. Our worship begins to uh, tend toward the lies of Satan. And all of those lies can apply to the marriage situation. That again, when they creep in, you start to lie to one another. You start to lie to yourself. You start to worship self. You start to worship other things. And that is where the failures in marriage begin to take place. I'd like for us to go back to Ephesians chapter 5. As we look to the second point, the faithfulness in worship. The faithfulness in worship. Husbands, men, buckle your seatbelts because we'll get to you in just a moment. But this section here, these verses are specifically for the wife. And men, we can learn a lot from them, so don't, don't shut it off. Uh, we need to also listen. We need to also understand that there is faithfulness in worship. And again, wives, we're, we're worshiping our Heavenly Father. It's a worship issue. It's not so much a submission problem. When you have that problem, it's a worship disorder. You're, you're worshiping the wrong thing. The foundational pr- principle of submission is laid out in the 21st verse. We saw that last week, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It, this is speaking that every Christian needs to be spirit-filled. Every Christian needs to have and put on the cloak of humility and be submissive to the Lord Jesus Christ. As MacArthur says, he says, no one is inherently superior to any other believer. What this verse is speaking about is that it's of our position before God. We are equal. Galatians 3.28 even says that there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. With that in context, let's dive into what this means. Wives, submit to your own husbands. The spiritual wife's supreme submission is to the Lord. Her attitude is that she lovingly submits as an act of obedience, uh, act of obedience to the Lord who has given this command as his will for her to re- regardless of her husband's personal worthiness or spiritual condition, MacArthur continues. This is why we say there's faithfulness in this worship. First Peter addresses this very thing. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. That act of faithfulness with your own, that personal husband of yours. It's an act of worship. You're not worshiping your husband as much as husbands you want that to happen. That is a wrong view of worship. This is not what God had set up. God designed marriage as an act of worship. And everything done inside marriage is worship related. It was his plan all along. Submission, again, is not a one and done thing. You say at, at, at the moment that we got married in the front of the church, that's when submission happened and then everything else is off the table. No, it is a continuous act. Be steadfast in submission. Be steadfast in your submission. Peter continues, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Peter was writing to a group of Christian women who were, who were married to an unsaved Roman. In that culture, Roman soldiers and Roman uh, men were just the supreme leaders and they had their thumb into everything and they directed their wives in ways that are just unimaginable and so peter's even telling these wives to submit to that and they're thinking what in the world what's the idea well he 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 concludes he's saying that we're trying to win them without a word by the conduct of their wives they begin to notice that there's a difference in this relationship the loving, gracious submission of a Christian woman to her unsaved husband is the strongest evangelistic tool that she has. No amount of uh, inviting to events, no amount of, of leaving Bibles and leaving gospel tracts throughout the house, th- whatever you might try to do, no amount of that is a greater evangelistic tool than what Ephesians tells us and what First Peter 3 tells us to do. 
Be steadfast and continue doing this over and over and over again. Be steadfast. And then it has this idea, lastly, to be insincere in the submission. The text in Ephesians reminds us to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So as the church is to continue submitting over and over and over again, so is the wife. His body and his himself, its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so ought also wives submit in everything to their husbands. There's an act of sincerity in this. Do not let your adorning be external, says Peter. The braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, the clothing you wear saying that it's not right to try to to seduce your husband into becoming morally right, into being spiritually right. And uh, Peter is explaining that to these these women who who are married to unsaved believers. He's saying, be sincere in this. Be um, steadfast. And then thirdly, be faithful in submission. Now when it comes to the husbands, we begin reading in verse number 25 that there is an act of influence. There is influence within your worship. See, as the leader of your home, as the one that's responsible for the well-being of your family, for the one that's going to be getting the blame, so to speak, by God, because again, husbands, this is how he ordained it. We we find that earlier on in in the scriptures, Genesis 2 and 3. And... um, I think I shared this definition with you before, but my wife says that submission is for the wife to duck so God can hit her husband. That's what submission is. And I like that definition. I don't like to get hit all the time, but um, that's what happens. So submission is, again, the wife worshiping God, worshiping her Heavenly Father, and following what Scripture says about submission and being being subject uniquely to her own husband, whereas the husband, being the, the head of the home, the one that God puts this, this act of worship for him to guide and direct his family in this worship. And you have quite a bit of influence. How can you utilize your influence? By number one, be loving with your influence. We find that the very first thing that God says to husbands, husbands, love your wives you cannot expect a submissive wife if the husband is not loving and loving and submission continue to go together it is not uh, there was another book that i was going to put up there but it was called an 80 80 relationship that's not really how marriage works it's a hundred and a hundred you're both giving a hundred percent a hundred percent of the time it's you are a team Scripture even says that you have uh, left your father and mother. You have joined together. You've become one flesh. God sees you as one unit. And with this relationship, you need to be loving. Without love, all other virtues amount to mere moralism. It's little else. There's nothing else if you're not loving. You can try to add all these other things, but that's just trying to be a moral person. It has nothing to do with the relationship that Christ has for His church. So we need to be loving. That's the foundational principle when it comes to our influence. First, thir- First Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13.1 If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It's like me going over to this drum set. I have no idea how to play that thing. And I'm just beating away. That's what it is in your relationship without love. You're just a noisy drum set. You're you're just making noise. If you're not loving husbands, you are not using your influence that God gave you to grow your family, to help your family, to help your community as being that impact that God wants you to be. When love is present, there is harmony, there is unity, Uh, Love binds these other virtues together, completing a loving garment of Christ-like character. Second way that you can utilize your influence is being sacrificial, not holding anything back. The text continues, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ sacrificed himself for you, for me, for the church. And husbands, sacrifice yourself for 
your wife, you say, I'm big and bad. I'll die for my wife. I'll take a bullet for my wife. Listen, if you're not living for your wife, how do you expect to die for your wife? If you're not living for her, if you're not constantly worshiping God and loving your wife, what good is it if you die for your wife if you're not living for her? And a way that you can live for her is by sacrificing yourself daily. Luke 9, 23, and he says to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Adrian Rogers says it like this. Do you know what most homes need? They need two funerals and one wedding. That's what they need. Where a wife dies to herself, a husband dies to himself, where a husband is willing to love his wife sacrificially. That's what it means to sacrifice. It's not that you're saying, well, I'll give up some of my time for my wife. No, you're, you're one unit. You're doing this life together. You're working together. This is my closet. That's her closet. And the two don't mix. That's her compartment. This is my compartment. No, God says that you're one unit. Husbands, sacrifice with your influence. Thirdly, be considerate with your influence. Be considerate with your influence. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. And all the wives say, that wasn't very convincing. Live with your wives in an understanding way. I heard a, a preacher use this as an illustration. He was trying to buy a car. And uh, he was saying that what they could afford was a, uh, a Honda Civic hatchback and and it was just he and his wife, and, and so they went, and they were going to look at it, and they were going to buy it, and the wife looked over at the four-door uh, sedan instead of the hatchback, and the preacher said, well, we don't need that one, and she said, but it has four doors. He said, what do you mean? Th this one has two doors. I have a door. You have a door. What's, what's the difference? And we don't need four doors, and she said, well, what if we have children? He said, well, he can have the hatchback. You know, I have a door, you have a door, he has, the, the, he has the hatch. Well, anyway, he didn't do this verse. He didn't live with his wife in an understanding way. They bought the hatchback, and um, a few months later, guess what happened? She was pregnant, and he said, did you know that it's very difficult to get a child through the hatchback? And so he said, I didn't live with my wife in an understanding way. I should have done that. And it wasn't a horribly wrong decision at that time, but I didn't live with my wife in an understanding way. So be considerate with your influence. Look to the other side. Look to the other party and say, I'm going to understand you. I'm going to understand what, what you're thinking and how you're feeling and, and deal with all that and be considerate with your influence. And you say, Pastor Jeremy, once you have that figured out, you need to let me know. Again, it's this living with your wife in an understanding way. Focus on her needs. Focus on and by loving her, sacrificing for her, and be uh, considerate, be considerate. With that influence, also be courteous. There is a difference. Be courteous, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, Peter says. It's not saying that um, she is a, just worth nothing. No, that's not what this text is talking about. Uh, a way that I heard this illustrated once is that men are like cast iron skillets, and women, wives, are like fine china. So they both have uses, but one, whereas you would just throw around and put over an open fire and, and just, you know, not really take too good a care of, whereas fine china, you, you're, it's, it's delicate, it's different, it's different uses. And so that's what this text is talking about, and understand that, and be courteous about that. Be courteous with your influence. The text continues that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her, by the washing of water with the word, so that he, that's Jesus, might present to the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that should be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. You're courteous to your own body. You're considerate of your own body. So ought we to be with our spouse. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes uh, cherishes it just as Christ does for the church. And then lastly, husbands, be a compliment. Be a compliment 
with your influence. The text says, because we are members of his body, verse 31, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Be a compliment with your influence. Questions for us to think about this week are things like, how can I pray specifically for my spouse this week? What are her needs? What are his needs? What is he feeling? What is she feeling? What ways can I be courteous? What ways can I be considerate? What ways can I be sincere and steadfast in my submission? What are ways for us to just simply compliment one another? And then you say, I'm not married here. I'm not even thinking about marriage. That's, maybe you're young and say, that's a distance away from me. You may say, well, maybe it's around the corner. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to propose next month. Who knows? But either way, this is all important for us, whether you're married or unmarried, because now the second question for like you to ponder is, how can I pray for the couples in this church this week? Think of a couple this week. Can you do this for me? Whether you're married, unmarried, single, Think of, yes, your own marriage if you're in a relationship, if you're married. But also, will you think of a couple this week and pray for them? You don't know their needs. You don't know what they're going through. But allow God to lay somebody on your heart so that you can pray for them this week. Pray for them spiritually. Pray for them mentally. Pray for them emotionally. Pray for them that they may look to the Scriptures and find rest and peace in their relationship. Satan wants so badly to attack our homes. He wants so badly to put these lies into our homes, destroy our homes, and destroy our community. Don't let that happen. Pray for one another that God will just uh, protect these marriages. God organized this. God orchestrated marriage. Let Him be the guidance and the direction in our marriages this week. Church, will you stand with me as we close in prayer? Father, we come to you and we thank you for this passage. Lord, as it difficult it is to try to stomach and to try to understand, help us to do that very thing. We cannot do this by ourselves. Help us to not put our worship in anything or anyone other than you, the Lord Jesus. Father, we ask for help for our church. We ask for help with the marriages and the family units within our church. Lord, we need you now more than ever. And I pray that as our couples go about their week this week, that you'll strengthen them, you'll help them, you'll guide them. And Lord, we pray for those that uh, maybe are not married in this church. We just pray that you'll strengthen them, you'll encourage them through this, but help them also to seek uh, a benefit and uh, pray for others uh, within our body. And I just pray that you just guide us and direct us. Thank you for this day and for this text. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, we thank you for this day. We pray this week um, as kids start school, as for teachers and administrators and um, kids going to college and um, all the new things and all of the, the different things that will be happening. I, I pray that your hand would be in all of it. And God, that your, um, that, that your word, that your, uh, the knowledge that um, the gospel will go into all of these places. And uh, we just pray for uh, this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed week.